Treatment of a small alkyl halide like methyl bromide with a different halide like chloride can lead to substitution. And of course, bromide would be the other product. Now, we can understand how this happens. Chloride has unshared pairs of electrons. Let me write one of them in there. This is a polar covalent bond, so bromide has a partial negative charge. Carbon has a partial positive charge. And it's easy to picture this pair of electrons being attracted to the partial positive charge to form a bond with carbon if this sigma bond leaves to go with bromine to make bromide. So we're watching two pairs of electrons move. The chloride electron pair being used to form a new sigma bond, the carbon bromine sigma bond breaking to form bromide. We know how it happens, but let me ask you this. How fast does this happen? Is it favored? Are products favored? Or are starting materials more stable and this might not happen at all? These are questions of energetics that are easily answered by looking at an energy diagram for the reaction. Take a look. Here's an energy diagram that shows the energetics of the reactants, the products, and the reacting species in between. As we look at this energy diagram, there are three aspects about the energetics that we're specifically looking at. In addition to the energy of the reactants and the energy of the products, we are looking for a change in the energy, the difference between the reactants and the products. And that's this value. We're looking at the energy barrier that the reaction has to surmount to happen. That's called the activation energy. And that's the difference between the very highest energetic point and where the reactants start. We call the activation energy EA. This is telling us how difficult it is for this reaction to happen, how high the energy barrier is to making it happen. And that is determined by the structure of the transition state, what the reactants look like at the very peak. So we have the energy of the reactants, the activation energy, the structure of the transition state, and the energy of the products which determines the overall change in energy for this reaction. And when we can see all of this just by glancing at this energy diagram, very powerful tool. We know that the reactants are less stable than the products, so this reaction will be favorable. We see the height of the energy barrier, so we can judge how fast or slow this reaction is. The height of that energy barrier is determined by the transition state. So we probably can say something about the structure of the transition state in this process as well. Now I have labeled this y-axis as energy without being more specific. But many people prefer to be much more specific about the energy that we're talking about. And while the generic term energy can be applied, in many cases we will be talking about enthalpy, abbreviated delta H. And delta H is essentially the difference in bond energy between reactants and products. And delta H will be negative if the products are more stable than the reactants. The bonds in the products are stronger than the bonds in the reactants. Seems backwards, but negative is favorable. Going to more stable is favorable, even though we call this negative change. Not everybody is happy with using the term enthalpy for this y-axis, and understandably because more specifically, free energy is what we really should be talking about if we want to look at the whole energetic picture. And the changes in free energy is symbolized by delta G. So at times we may just be general and say energy. Other times we'll be specific, talking about bond energies, change in enthalpy, delta H. And other times we'll look at the whole energetic picture and be talking about delta G, which is the very best picture for energetics of a system. And when the change in any of these values is negative, the reaction is favorable, the products are more stable than reactants. Let's look at a case when it's just the opposite. In this reaction diagram, we see that the change in energy goes from lower to higher. So this is a positive number. And a positive value for the change in energy means that the formation of products is unfavorable, that we have to put energy in to make this happen. The second thing we notice is the energy barrier. And then the energy barrier is at the peak 
where the truck structure of the transition state determines the height of that change in energy, is the activation energy. And as you might guess, you see this in this case, the activation energy, the energy barrier that has to be surmounted to make the reaction happen is much higher in a case where we're making products that are higher energy than the reactants. And again, just to be complete, we could be talking about, rather than change in E, delta H, bond dissociation energy changes, or to be fully complete, free energy, in which case we'd be calling this delta G. In any of these situations, we see that the energetics say that this is an uphill reaction. It's unfavorable. It's very easy to see. We can see the activation energy. This is going to be a much slower reaction because it has a higher energy barrier than this one that has a much lower energy barrier, and so it would happen more readily. Take a look at this energy diagram. Not all chemical reactions are one-step reactions. In fact, is most are not. And here's an energy diagram that we can easily see instantly is for a two-step reaction. How can we see that? Because there's two humps. There's two energy barriers. And every time there's a reaction step, there'll be an energy barrier to that step. And so in energy diagrams, the number of humps that we see corresponds to the number of sequential steps that must happen to go from reactants to products. So we have an energy diagram that starts with reactants at this energy, makes an intermediate, which then in a second step forms products. Just to give you an example of the kind of thing that could be happening, let's suppose we have two atoms attached, Y and Z. I don't want to specify what they are, it doesn't matter. And that when we heat those, they dissociate. We picture, let's say, this pair of electrons staying with Z. That would happen if Z were more electronegative than Y. To form an intermediate Y plus, and of course, Z minus. And in a second step, some nucleophile that has a lone pair of electrons forms a bond with Y, as indicated by this arrow pushing from a pair of electrons to where the electrons are going, bonding with Y to form a product Y and U. And this carbocation would be the intermediate we're talking about here. No wonder it's higher energy. We would expect a carbocation to be higher energy than a molecule that had atoms with filled valence shells. And in a second step, forms products. Two humps, two arrows for sequential steps, one transformation. The reactants start at higher energy than the products. So we can easily say that this is overall favorable. The change in energy, whether it's delta H or delta G is unimportant, the change in energy shows us that the products are more stable. So this will have a negative value. Of course, are the transition states or the two steps and the structures of those transition states determine the energy of the activation, the activation energy. If there are two steps, there'll be two activation energies. And so the energy barrier that we see is clearly higher for the first step than the second step. And we can immediately conclude that the first step is slower than the second. So it's something that we'll term the slow step. And as we talk about later, we'll want to focus on the slow step because that's the step that determines the overall rate of the reaction. So we can see that Ea for the first step is much bigger than Ea for the second step. We can see that the intermediate is formed with some difficulty. It's higher energy. It more readily goes to products that are lower energy, more stable than reactants. The change in energy overall is negative. These energy diagrams show you all this information about this process at a glance. We'll find that they're very useful.